Hilchis Shvuos Perek Asiri, the laws of oaths, chapter ten. We're dealing with the Shvuos Haedus, the laws governing the oath of testimony. The basic scenario is where a man approaches two witnesses and believes that they can be of help in a court case. So he says, "I want you to swear that you're going to come testify for me." Um, in the court case that I need. And they deny knowing any testimony, and they swear to their denial, or they answer amen to his adjuring them. Some form of oath is accepted, and then it's revealed that they're lying. This is where they incur the liability of shvua sa'edus, of having sworn falsely over testimony. As we learned yesterday, there are ten conditions to create the ideal situation for a testimony oath to be considered um, powerful enough to hold you liable. And today, we're going to first briefly touch on the character of the witnesses themselves, but then mainly for the rest of the chapter, we're going to focus specifically on one of the ten conditions that we learned yesterday. And that is the idea of edus mamain, that the testimony being given needs to be bringing about or involved in a court case which is dealing with financial obligation. If the testimony which they're being asked to give doesn't have a result of financial obligation, then the scenario is not created, and even if they swear, and even if it's revealed that they're speaking falsely, they're not liable for Shavuah Sa'edos, they're not liable for the testimony oath. That's going to be what we're majorly going to be focused on, but again, in the beginning, we have a brief halacha about the character of the witnesses themselves. It says that Ammam Halacha Aleph, Hayu Eidav Oy Echad Mehen, Pasul Oy Karev, if both witnesses that he's approaching, or even one, is a witness that's disqualified. In the 14th book of the Rambam, there's a whole section of laws called Hilchis Eidos. There the Rambam discusses at length different type of disqualifications that make a witness not allowed to give testimony in court. Transgressing certain sins makes you have a bad record. Different things like that. So if a person is puzzled, or he's a relative, who's also a non-kosher witness. Even if it's disqualified witnesses rabbinically, that means biblically they're okay. It's the rabbis who imposed the disqualification. Or one of the witnesses was the Jewish king, who's not fit to give testimony, as we learn about in the laws of testimony. A king does not provide testimony in court. It has to do with the fact that we're supposed to be in constant awe of him. It's part of our respect, not to put him on the witness stand. The point is that one of the witnesses is not fit to give testimony. Or, one of the witnesses in question is only basing his testimony on hearsay. He heard from another witness. He wasn't actually present at the time of whatever the court case in question may be. The kafru v'nishbu and such a pair of witnesses denied knowing testimony about a given case and swore to their denial. Pturin mishvu asaidus. They are exempt, they're not held liable on account of a false testimony oath. She'ilu he'idu, because even if they would have testified, they wouldn't have incurred a financial obligation on the part of the defendant because their testimony would be unacceptable. And so, since their testimony cannot bring about a financial obligation, they are exempt in this case. And now we're going to move much more into this idea. There is edus mamain, testimony which concerns financial obligation, edus misa, testimony which concerns capital punishment, edus she'eina mamain, there's other categories of testimony that are not financial obligation but deal with other issues in ritual and Jewish law, and we're going to see that you're only held liable if your testimony can fall into this category, not into any of the other categories. It says that amam halacha beis, mashbi'ani aleichem, a man approaches two people and he says, I adjure you, that you should come and testify for me. Come testify that Mr. A told me, promised me to give me 200 bucks, and he never gave it. That's, that's the kind of case I want you to testify about. The kafru, and they denied knowing anything about this. Even if they swore to the denial, and they were speaking falsely because they actually knew, they're exempt from having made a false oath of testimony. Because even if they would testify about such a matter, they, they wouldn't be powerful enough to obligate the defendant to pay money. Because all he gave was his word. I promise I'll give you 200 bucks. In Jewish law, a promise, a verbal promise in this, of this type doesn't hold you financially liable. Anything similar that's like this 
would be governed by the same rules. Their testimony cannot lead to a financial obligation. They're off the hook for Shavua Sa'edos for testimony oaths. Halacha Gimel Tvan If the person had demanded that these witnesses come testify, about his genealogical status, about his pedigree, he's a Kohen, he's a Levite, or She'ene ben Grusha, ben Chalutza, or perhaps he was from a Kohen family and there was a question about his mother's status. Was she a divorcee? Did she undergo chalitza? Chalitza is the procedure when a person dies childless, his widow has to either marry their brother-in-law or take their brother-in-law to court and do a whole procedure which we learned about at length in the fourth book of the Rambam. And once she does so, she is free to marry anybody, but she's called a chalitza and can never marry a Kohen. So let's say this guy wants to clear his name. There's a rumor about his mom that she's a divorcee or a chalitza and she married a Kohen, and he wants these two people to come and testify that I'm not, that I'm, 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 I'm from a good lineage, the kafru v'nishbu. So even if the witnesses deny knowing anything about this and they swear to their denial, pturin mishvua sa'edos. If it's discovered that they're lying, they're exempt from having made a false oath of testimony, she'ein kan edos mamin, because again here, there's no issue of financial obligations. All he's asking to say is other issues, genealogy. And only for edos mamin, as we see here, is where you're liable. What if the person demands that the witnesses testify about capital cases? Testify that my son bruised me. So that somebody lit my granary on fire, my grain pile on fire on Shabbat. Capital offense. Testify that Mr. A raped or seduced the daughter that was engaged. When a daughter was already betrothed, she incurs the death penalty for such relations. The kafru v'nishbu and the witnesses denied knowing anything about this, and they swore to substantiate their denial. Pturin mishvua sa'edus, they're exempt on account of making a false testimony oath. She'ime idu edozu, because even had they gone to court and said the testimony, yishayev hanitva misas bezdin, the defendant would have been liable to the death penalty by the court. Ve'enichayev tashlumin, he wouldn't be liable to pay money. So even though it's greater than financial obligation, but the whole law of Shavuah Sa'edos only applies to financial issues. As we explained in the laws of the virgin girl in the end of the fourth book of the Rambam, that you don't ever die and pay at the same time. If you're subject to two punishments, you always get the more severe one. The Chayin Kal is anything similar over here as well. If it would be a capital offense at issue, then the witnesses wouldn't be held liable for Shavuah Sa'edos. Halacha Hei, another case. Haya Eid Echad. If a man approached only one witness, he says, come, testify in my case. The kafar v'hishbiyay. He denies knowing any information. And the man adjures him and he accepts the oath. Pater mishvua sa'edos, even if it's revealed that he's speaking falsely, he's exempt for having sworn a false testimony oath. She'ein edos eid echad nechayev mamin. Because the testimony of one witness doesn't have the power to create financial liability. It's a major rule in the Torah. Only two witnesses can make you pay money. One cannot. Now, we're going to see later, the maximum that one witness can do is require you to take an oath. It'll require the defendant to take an oath. And oaths are very scary. People don't want to take oaths in vain. They involve saying Hashem's name, as we're going to see in tomorrow's chapter and the next one. So, sometimes this, uh, this obligation to make an oath would deter the defendant, and he would say, you know what, I'd prefer to pay the obligation rather than make the oath. So, in a way... It could be said that the testimony of one witness could lead to financial obligation. But since that's up to the choice of the defendant, so relative to the witness, we can't say that. And therefore, if it's discovered that he's lying, his oath is not going to be considered a false shivua sa'edus. We're not going to hold him reliable for it, liable for it. However, we're going to see later in the chapter that if it's a case where even one witness would create a financial obligation for sure, then indeed, if he swears falsely, he's held liable. A person demands two witnesses to come testify for him that his wife committed adultery. The kafru v'nishbu, they denied any knowledge of it, and they swore to their denial. If they're discovered to be lying, they're liable for having taken a false oath of testimony. Because this is a monetary case. Had they got given testimony, they would cause her to forfeit her ketuba payout. Every woman is promised a certain amount of money in case of the end of the marriage, but not if she commits adultery. She loses her ketuba money. The pater zeshatvan, and that would exempt the husband who had demanded them to come say testimony. So 
If so, it turns out that these witnesses denied knowledge of testimony which involves financial obligation. So they're liable. A person charges witnesses of a warning or witnesses of seclusion to come testify for him. This is a reference to the Sota, a woman who is a suspected adulteress. The husband warns her against going into seclusion with another man, warns his wife, and she goes into seclusion with another man, but we don't know what happened inside that room. Then the husband must bring his wife to the temple where he gives her a whole concoction of bitter waters, as we learned at length in the Ramam's fourth book. And if she's clean, then she drinks the waters and it's okay. If she's guilty, she drinks the waters and she explodes. Now, the Rambam is talking about a case where the husband wants to substantiate his warning or the seclusion that followed the warning. So he's calling witnesses who he believes saw the warning or he believes saw the seclusion and he's asking them to come testify in court about it. And they denied any knowledge. The Nishbu and they swore to that denial. Turin Mishbu Asaidus, they are also exempt from making a false testimony oath. She'ilu he'idu ein chiyuv Because even if they had testified, all they would bring about is no financial obligation, only that the procedure would continue in the temple where the husband would go and give the woman to drink the bitter waters. Even though there is a potential case where it would lead to financial obligation, which is, if the woman would then refuse to drink the bitter waters, she'll forfeit her ksuba. A matter which will cause eventual financial obligation is not considered to be in the moment financial obligation. It's very possible she'll choose to drink and not forfeit her ksuba. Since it's up to her, on the witness's end, they are considered to be involved in a case that's not definite financial obligation, and hence they're not liable for making a false testimony oath. Let's say the warning and seclusion part is already verified. A man warns his wife against seclusion with another man. She went into seclusion. Witnesses watched that. And then, just one witness saw her actually commit adultery, after going into seclusion, which is one of the few cases in the Torah where one witness is believed fully. Once we have what's called raglayin ladavar, we have reason to be suspicious. We saw her get a warning. We saw her transgress the warning. All we need is one witness to confirm our suspicions, and he's believed. So the husband is after this one witness. The husband adjures this witness to come say testimony that his wife committed adultery. The kafar, he denied knowledge of this adultery. If it's discovered that he's lying, he's liable for making a false testimony oath. Even though he's only one witness, and one witness who said before in Allah, hey, isn't powerful enough usually. In this case, had he given the testimony that he's being asked to give, the woman would forfeit her ksuba. As we explained in the laws concerning the suspected adulteress. And therefore, this is a case where one witness is powerful enough to create an edus mamein. Similarly, any time there's one witness who, who will cause an obligation of financial payment, if he denied and then swore to substantiate his denial, or he was adjured in court and he denied it the claim, he's liable on account of making a false oath of testimony. Kate says, what would be an example of a case where one witness could require financial payout? This would be a case where both the plaintiff and the defendant are suspect on making oaths. This will be a whole section of laws later on in the Ramam's 13th book where he talks about the, the laws of the litigants that are involved in a court case. Typically, if there's one witness to a given case, the defendant is not required to pay. He's required to make an oath. If the defendant has a past record which makes him suspect to make false oaths, we don't give him the chance to make the oath. Instead, we turn it over to the plaintiff and we say, hey, you swear to the truth of your claim, and if you can take the oath, you'll get the money. Now, what if the plaintiff also is suspect on making oaths? Nobody can make an oath. Since nobody can make an oath, we force the defendant to pay. So, let's create this case as it relates to the false oath testimonies. You have a case where the plaintiff and the defendant are both suspect over oaths where we're not going to make them take an oath because they're suspect. 
comes the plaintiff to the one witness and adjures him that he should come and testify that this guy owes him a money. The kafar, and he denies the knowledge of this testimony. If he's discovered to be lying, he'll be held liable for making a false oath of testimony. Because had he gone to court and testified, since both people are suspect on oaths, there would have been no oath administered. The defendant would have paid money because of the one witness's testimony. As will be explained in the laws of the litigants in the Ramam's 13th book. Anything similar is governed by the same laws. A woman asks a witness to come testify to the death of her husband. The kafar, if he denies knowing anything about this, he's liable to a false testimony oath. Because had he testified that the husband is dead, she would be able to get married and take a ketubah payout. It's clearly a financial obligation. His testimony is edus mamayim, and therefore denying it puts him in the category of liability. When does this case apply? When it was a case where the widow could have collected her ketubah from movable property. But if the case in her marriage was that she would only be able to collect her ketubah from land, real estate, then the case turns into not financial obligations. Because anytime it involves real estate, as we saw yesterday, it doesn't apply. You're, you're exempt from making a false testimony oath. Similarly, even if it was two witnesses, not just one. A person who adjures witnesses in a case of real estate, they're exempt, as we explained. A person adjures two witnesses in court, and they both deny together. The second witness denied knowing anything. Within three seconds, of the first witness denying. This is called teich kedei dibur. Teich kedei dibur literally means the time it takes to speak. Speak what? The time it takes to speak is defined in the Talmud as the time it takes to say the three words, Shalem Alecha Rabbi, peace unto you, my master. So that takes about two to three seconds. So if the first witness denied knowing any testimony and the second witness also denies within that time frame, they're considered to have denied together, if it's revealed that they're lying, they're both liable for having made a false oath. Each witness has to bring a sin offering for his false oath. But if the first witness made the denial, and the second witness waited longer than the time it takes to speak, in other words, longer than those two, three seconds to say Shalom Alecha Rabbi, and only then expressed his denial, Fascinatingly, only the first one is held liable and not the second one. Why? Watch this. Because after the first witness's denial, even if the second witness would have agreed, his testimony couldn't have gotten any money out of the guy because one witness isn't powerful enough to get money. So really, the first guy's denial helps the second guy. Because once he's alone, he can't act on his own. If it was the opposite, the first witness acknowledged the claim, and the second one denied it. The denier is liable. Whether he denied first or second. If they both denied at once, and then within the time it takes to speak, within the small time frame, two, three seconds, one of the witnesses who denied changed his mind, recanted, and acknowledged the claim, he is exempt. The one who's persisting in his denial is liable because he's just denying it flat out, and when he denied it, he could have been part of a group of witnesses that would have brought financial obligation. If a person adjures two groups of witnesses, so we have four people on the table, he's talking to all four, he's saying, I want you all to come testify for my case. And they're both, all, they're, both peers are both kosher, they're all kosher witnesses. The kafra kasri shayna, the akhrakah kafra kasniya. This group denies knowing anything, and then this group denies knowing anything. Harishayna ptura mishvua saidas. The first group will be exempt from making a false oath because they're relying on this group. They go, look, even if we deny it, these two can still go to the court and give testimony, and they'll be powerful enough to get the money. So they're 
testimony alone isn't needed to get the money. It's possible to get the money with the testimony of the other group. Which means that the defendant doesn't need these two witnesses to be required to pay money. And therefore, they're out of the game. If they deny, they're exempt. But if the second group of witnesses would have been disqualified, let's say they were related to the defendant or the plaintiff, through their wives, even if the wives are on their deathbed and they're about to sever the familiar relationship, the familial relationship, the bottom line is, in the moment, they're disqualified witnesses. Since they're disqualified witnesses, only these witnesses are able to create the financial obligation. So when they deny knowledge of the testimony, they're the only ones who could have ever given the testimony. Them alone are powerful to get the money. So, they're, so they're, they're, they're liable. The second group, when the first group denied, wasn't fit to give testimony. Even if very soon they're going to be fit. Because when the women who are on their deathbeds are going to die. You can imagine how dry halacha is. You have people on their deathbed, and all we're worried about is, you know, they're going to give testimony the next second. But the point is, technically, from a, from a logical standpoint, they could very soon become fitting to give testimony. But if in the moment they're not, then the first group is held liable for their denial. But if indeed the second group would have denied the testimony after their wives die, they're now also, also liable for giving a false testimony oath because on their own they're powerful enough to create the financial obligation. Another scenario which will interplay with this concept of edus mamayn, of... Uh, Financial obligation testimony. You have a guy, a juror's witnesses to come testify, they, they, they deny any knowledge. He adjures them, they say amen, they accepted his oath. He repeats it four or five times. I put you under oath. You guys, no testimony, come. No, we don't. I put you under oath again. No, we don't. And they keep on answering amen to every oath outside of the court. But when they finally come to court, they actually acknowledge the claim and they give the proper testimony. They are exempt from giving the, from giving a, the original false oath of testimony, as we explained, because outside of the court, denial doesn't help. The denial has to be made in a court, as we explained the other day. But if they came to court and they didn't change their mind, they persisted in their denial, then retroactively, they're going to be held accountable for each individual oath which they answered amen to outside of the court. Of course, that only applies if they answered amen. But if they didn't answer a verbal acceptance with the word amen, they simply just denied in response to each time that they were adjured, since the bottom line is they never expressed an oath with their mouths, nor did they accept one verbally, then later when they come to court and they persist in their denial, they're going to be held actually exempt until both the adjuring and the denial happens in the court as we explained. If there's no amen, if there's no amen being answered, everything has to happen in the court. If there is an amen answered, only the denial has to happen in the court. But if there's no amen, both the denial and the oath have to be administered in court. Let's say he adjures them in the court. They deny in the court. And he does it again, four or five times in the court. And they're denying each one. Even if the later oaths were administered outside of the court, even if they answered amen and they swore on their own time after time, they're only going to be held liable once for a false testimony oath. Because once they denied one time in court, they're considered deniers. Even a later admission won't help them anything. So the repeated oaths and the repeated denials don't really make a halachic difference after they denied it once in court. Therefore, we only hold them liable for that one denial in the beginning. This means, it turns out that you're learning, any future oaths that they make 
after that first denial in the court, are basically a denial of testimony which doesn't involve monetary obligation. Because they're already considered to be deniers that their testimony wouldn't be accepted in a court. Which therefore they're exempt on account of a false testimony oath. But the Rambam again concludes with this point that he repeats again and again throughout these chapters that even when you're exempt, for making a false testimony oath, you're still held liable for a false standard oath, because the bottom line is you lied. You said a false testimony. You said a false oath, excuse me. And therefore, even in a case where you're putter, where you're exempt for the testimony oath, you're going to be held liable for having made a false standard oath.